I sometimes read uh, public domain books here on Leaves of Glen. And they were written a long time ago, uh, so they're usually uh, racist or sexist or bigoted. Uh, but in there somewhere and all that is a, a story, and that's why those stories are famous. Other times, I read uh, works from independent authors, and they're delightfully not racist, but they might have adult language or adult situations. So that's your warning, uh, but I'm sure you uh, are grown up enough to handle it. Don't write to me complaining. Leaves of... Leaves of Glen. Leaves of... Leaves of Glen. It's saying this for so many years, it loses all meaning. It's like when you say your name over and over for like an hour. It just doesn't mean anything anymore. Oh, hello. And welcome to... Leaves of Glen. Uh, the mansion of Leaves of Glen. Well, that sounds better. Now it's got meaning again. Uh, this is a fun little bit I do where I pretend to uh, be recording to you uh, from a mansion when actually it's just my basement. Uh, currently, uh, back in my bedroom because the mice are back and I don't want to be down in that basement hearing traps go off. It's disturbing. Uh, this is where I read the hottest public domain books and short stories. Uh, this week, I'm reading the story, uh, The Day of the Nuptial Flight by Serena Dory from her book, Won't You Be My Neighbor? Uh, it's published on March 18th, 2021. Want to learn about the author? Sure you do. Serena Dory sold over 170 short stories to markets like Analog, uh, Daily Science Fiction, Magazine of Fantasy and Science Fiction, Orson Scott Card's IGMS, Cosmos, uh, and Abyss and Apex. Her stories and published novels have won humor contests and Romance Writer of America awards. Uh, she has over 50 novels published, including her best-selling series, Wombie School for Wayward Witches. Uh, you can find out more, uh, along with uh, more of her work, at serenadory.com. And you can sign up for a newsletter uh, to learn about new releases and offers. There's always a discount going on. I get them, and I see them. Uh, I'll link to that in the show notes. Uh, fun facts... Well, one fun fact is I've started Serena Dory Month early. I planned on doing it next month. Uh, but with my recording schedule, bouncing back and forth between me and Ben reading a Twilight book uh, once a week. Uh, so, yeah, I realized, ah, poop, I'm running out of space. So I'm starting it a week early. You'll just have to deal with it. Uh, so, uh, fun fact, I got one. By day, Serena is a public school art teacher, artist, belly dance performer, and instructor. Copy editor, fashion designer, event organizer, and probably a few other things. Uh, but by night, she writes. So there's that. Uh, so I guess we could dive into the story pretty soon here. I guess I have to fill up the remaining time before the grandfather clock goes off with an uh, interesting tidbit about my life. Uh, uh, interesting tidbits. My life is still pretty boring. I don't really have a whole lot going on. I got a bunch of trees chopped down, thanks to the city forcing me to do that. But I've already talked about that with Ben. My dryer works. Uh, but I already talked about that with Ben. Uh, my 23-year-old cat has uh, started tearing his own hair out and peeing everywhere. Uh, it took forever to get into the vet because everybody bought pets during COVID. And now everyone's bringing their pets in all the time with all these problems. And, just like when people were hoarding toilet paper, people are trying to bring back their pets and stuff. Uh, so that's weird, but I've always had pets, and uh, I'm really annoyed that it takes forever to get my pet into an appointment. So I finally did, and they said, well, your pet's probably got arthritis because he's 23 years old, uh, so he's probably in pain, and that's why he pulls out his hair, and he's probably trying to let you know he's in pain by peeing everywhere. I said, fine. Uh, what can we do? They said, well, we got this delicious pill. He doesn't take the pill. Then they said, well, we got a delicious powder. I tried putting the powder on his food. He just won't eat the food. I said, what the hell am I supposed to do? And they said, well, we got, uh, like a, a liquid you can squirt in his mouth. I said, fine. I said, give him 0.5 milliliters, whatever, of it, and, uh, squirt it in his mouth. So I did. I squirted it in his mouth along with his Flippin' thyroid medication. It's the most expensive cat I think anyone's ever owned. How much I spend on him regularly, monthly. Uh, so I squirt it in there, and then I go off and do my own thing. Eh, minding my own business, sitting around doing stuff. And then I'm up in the bathroom, peeing, sitting down like a man does, because it's just easier 
and less messy. Don't judge me. Uh, and, the, and then the cat comes upstairs and just collapses next to me. And I said, oh, my God. Because, oh, oh, the grandfather clock's going off telling me to shut up. Anyways, turns out I drugged my cat too much. He's too old for that much. So he was drugged up all night, and I was worried like crazy. The vet told me to reduce the dosage, and he's fine now. Now he can jump up on the bed and yell at me in the morning because he wants food. Let's, let's get on with our story. Day of the nuptial flight. I will try to use uh, the words uh, a human might understand, uh, for that is what you are and what you will grow up to be, as much as you may be part of my world, too. The day of the nuptial flight, the sweet, heady pheromones of the mating season has filled the tunnels of our underground hive. Oh, the queen's perfume grew stronger, causing me to, to tremble, oh, with longing. As I neared the entrance of the above world, I, uh, I shot out of the tunnel at the base of our tree and into the air, the light blinding. I collided with uh, someone mid-flight, uh, veered off, and uh, sm I smacked into somebody else. Oh, a thousand cents crashed down upon me, the queen's trail lingering in the air, the, uh, the musky odor of the drones following her and trying to conceal where she had gone, the undiluted nectar of the flowers and the powdery poison of the mothra flies uh, amidst our flight. All my eyes adjusted to the black swarm all around me. Uh, it wasn't just the queen and drones from my hive in this nuptial flight, but, but all the queens and drones from, uh, fr from every hive. Oh, I have my pickings of queens, <laughs> if I could only find one. The spray of a queen drifted my way in the wind. Oh, I set off in a new direction, my wings humming as fast as they would go. Oh, honey, honey sloshed in my gut tube, and my thorax cramped with the exertion of flight. Oh, my eyes adjusted to the brightness. Ah, below, I spotted the blue iridescence of a queen. Her abdomen was swollen with unfertilized eggs. A male an eighth her size, was busily mating with her. Oh, I drifted lower, ready to join him, <laughs> from the shadowy cover of a tri-leaf. Uh, an arachnopede barbarian jumped out and caught them both in his mouth. Oh, I flitted off, uh, nearly losing my honey at witnessing the disturbing sight. I ventured farther from my hive, darting about, hoping to catch another queen scent. Uh, any queen would do. My body trembled with need. Overwhelmed! by the sexual charge in the air. I was out of the thick of the swarm, the drones around me growing scarcer, and yet the trail of a queen grew stronger. Hmm. In opalescence, uh, purple-blue glinted in the sunlight. I tore through the air after her, gaining speed. Uh, uh, once I caught up, oh, I danced around her, chittering songs of love and devotion. Oh, queen of the purple-blue tribe, uh, your youth and beauty are a thousandfold. I will explode uh, with passion for you. And when I cease, I will chew off my genitals and become your handmaiden. If only you'll have me. If only you'll have me. If only you'll have me. I landed on her back. Oh, my genitals rubbing against her posterior. Uh, my exoskeleton rattled with pleasure, <laughs> jostling the honey in my gut tube. And my, uh, uh, my abdominal armor slid back as the queen dropped toward the ground. Now we descended into the fluff of a purple pollen bed at the center of a giant flower. I regurgitated over her side, pleased to see her, to see her lap up my gift without hesitation. Oh, her tail end lifted into the air. My body shuddered with pleasure as I brought my, ab uh, my abdomen down to, to fertilize the queen. Her musk of desire called me. My armor slid further back, exposing the entirety of my genitals. The tension in my muscles was too great to hold. Uh, nothing happened. Uh, she, she turned her head, antenna projecting confusion, and then, uh, and then anger. Uh, uh, spray me, drone, <laughs> she screeched. <laughs> I tried, but my head swam with, uh, with dizziness, and I tried again, and my genitals didn't explode into her uh, like they were supposed to. My, my, my mandibles frothed uh, with the effort, and she didn't appear to notice. Uh, how dare you insult me like this? You, you, you tease me with an offering, but uh, you refuse to fertilize me? Her antenna uh, twitched, and she 
fucked. All her words vibrating through the air. Uh, get off me. Yeah, worthy of chewing off your genitals uh, and becoming a handmaiden. <laughs> straight, straight to the honeypot chamber for you. Uh, no, I wailed. Uh, let me try again. Two more drones landed on our flower, and they regurgitated offerings of nectar, and she permitted them to both uh, to mount her. Where, where had I gone wrong? Had I gorged on too much honey that day? Or was, uh, was something wrong with me? Oh, I knew I should have waited on the edge of the flower for the queen to, to break off my wings. Uh, she would carry me back her home and, and serve her for the remainder of my life as a honey pot, a, a living food vessel uh, with, 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 with no other purpose uh, than to eat and to be eaten. Uh, but watching the other two drones filled me with despair. Uh, the muscles beneath the thorax swelled, uh, putting painful pressure on my armor. My antenna twitched as failure rattled me to the core. I flew off, staying low to the ground, not caring if an arachnopede pounced on me or uh, a flesh-eating mothfly caught me in its jaws. A forest of flowers stretched before me, and I landed on a purple one, sending up a, a puff of pollen. I nuzzled into the ruffles of the stamen and poked my tongue down into the pool of nectar. I stored some of my cheek sack uh, as an offering for the next queen. It was possible I might do better next time. I slurped the remainder of the nectar into my, into my gut tube, occasionally looking up for arachnopedes or flesh-eating mothfies. But, and on the flower, just to my right, uh, a blue and black striped fuzzy pillar chomped down on, the, on purple ruffles, sending powder up into the air. Oh, she consumed the flower bit by bit until she was forced to lower herself down to the stem. Munching on the frills of leaves, a, a clot of dirt was stuck to the bristles on her back, uh, at least what I thought was a clot of dirt, though it was uh, far too sharp and angular to resemble any lump of earth I'd ever seen, uh, and there encased in the block of dirt was one of those queer-looking new creatures that had been invading my world. That's right, one of your people, uh, 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 the humans. Uh, mildly interested, I flitted over to examine her. Uh, I, I, I say her because surely it was a, it was a shepherd, and all our fuzzy pillar shepherds were female. When I landed, the creature ducked down, forcing me to climb up onto the fuzzy pillar to have a better look. Uh, the worker was about my size, though with no segmentation. Skinny and straight as a worm, this definitely had to be a sterile female. A shadow loomed over us. Uh, my antenna uh, tuned in on the soft flapping of wings, uh, signaling danger was near. I looked up just in time to see a giant red wing of a flesh-eating mothfly swoop down. Surely it wanted the plump blue fuzzy pillar, uh, not me. I dived off anyways uh, to avoid being brushed by those deadly wings, and the fuzzy pillar screeched and released its grasp on the stem, tumbling downward. The poison powder from the mothfly's wings collided with its body in a crimson cloud. My nerves rattling, I ducked under a cluster of flowers and uh, 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 hid. The fuzzy pillar writhed on the ground and the powder burning her skin. Uh, then a natural clod on her back uh, kept her from wiping the mothfly poison off the wriggling tentacle grass. A high-pitched cry like that of a frightened larva rattled over my antenna and I turned to find another of those four-legged invasive species, a queen like none other that I've ever seen. Oh, oh, her smell. My antenna danced before me. The pheromones of the eggs within her drew me closer. The tangy pollen of the purple flowers powdered her hair and skin. Honey sweat clung to the air about her. I don't know if I wanted to, to lick her or to mate with her. As she darted through the flower forest, uh, uh, her, her two feet, Taking her in a frenzied dance was just a was a mating dance uh, for me. Oh, but no! My antenna picked up a vibration in the air that didn't match that of the queen. And uh, in heat, despite what her pheromones said about the eggs ripe in her belly, she made the cry of the larva over and over. Uh, wah, wah! And she raced around the writhing fuzzy pillar, unable to find whatever she searched for. Now, I scuttled toward her, uh, drawn to her scent. Uh, it was like nothing I had ever smelled before, though her height uh, would have been, uh, it had been smaller than mine had she walked on all her four limbs, as I did with my six. Uh, she loomed regally above me onto her. Oh, her eyes were small, but the blackest I'd ever seen. A long, 
A black tuft of hair grew out of the top of her head. Uh, a blue sheath of skin covered her brown, warm, soft skin. And it took me a moment to realize that she, uh, yeah, she had no wings. It didn't look like they'd been broken off. It's just that she had none. Well, that didn't mean anything. The little greens, a species uh, like my own hive, though far more diminutive, uh, didn't have wings. This was definitely a queen. The swollen abdomen was a giveaway. Even if her store of eggs was smaller than the queen of my hive, uh, she stared up at a leaf on um, the flower's headless stalk, and I saw that she searched for it now, and, and held in the lacy embrace of that leaf was the wormy body of her attendant, pungent dew extruded from the queen's pores, uh, liquid salt spilling, spilling from her eyes. I flitted up to the leaf, noticing he screamed louder than ever, and the convulsing attendant was covered in red powder. I landed on the earth beside the queen, uh, uh, your handmaiden isn't going to make it, I said. She stumbled back and hid behind a flower. Uh, she picked up a dried, broken flower stem, pointing toward me, and I twitched my antenna at the writhing fuzzy pillar. Uh, you better test to your fuzzy pillar before the poison eats through her skin. The queen acted as though she didn't hear me. The fuzzy pillar thrashed at that clod, or perhaps boulder, stuck to her back against the earth. Oh, I cooed at her, singing in the low, sweet tones that would be able to hear it. And the hollowed rock on her back was fastened around her body with straps. I sawed through them with my mandibles and threw the box aside. Now free, the fuzzy pillar wriggled the last of the powder off and, and turned her head over her shoulder to, to lick her back. It's amazing how resilient a fuzzy pillar's stomach is. Oh, I continued to coo softly, imitating the lullabies the workers of my kind sang, and she snuggled her face against mine, opened her immense mouth, and, and hawked a wad of sticky nectar into my mouth. Oh, I stuffed it in my cheeks. At save it for an offspring. Though it was laced with moth or fly poison, the antidote to the fuzzy pillar saliva would break it down if it had already done so. Uh, that's, a, that's a nice fuzzy pillar, I cooed, patting her soft exterior with my antenna. And I glanced at the queen, but she wasn't where I left her. Oh, she was attempting to climb up the stem of the flower uh, uh, to, to retrieve the uh, attendant. Uh, though her claws didn't sink into the surface, nor did they cling like a worker should have. Uh, probably she was too burdened uh, with eggs. Uh, you can't retrieve her. She's covered in poison. It'll just rub off on you, I said. Uh, she didn't look at me, and I hate to insult a queen, but if she truly wanted her attendant, there was an easier way, and I would show her. Flitting up a few lengths, I hooked my legs around the queen and gently set her down. Oh, the shrill, high-pitched sound she made uh, raked over my antenna. It didn't look as though I had injured her soft skin, but her face wrinkled up, and I bowed my head and shrank back. I cooed to the fuzzy pillar who scampered over, nuzzling me again, <laughs> and I backed toward the stem and, uh, and up it, singing all the while. And the fuzzy pillar faithfully followed me, trying to, <laughs> trying to, to nuzzle me each time she came close. Uh, I backed away, drawing her a little further. Uh, once I reached the leaf where the worker lay, I opened wide for the fuzzy pillar to regurgitate a wad of nectar. Instead of storing it or uh, swallowing it, I softened it in my mouth and then spit it onto the worker. We repeated the process several times until the visible side of the queen's attendant was covered from head to foot, and I turned her over and coaxed the fuzzy pillar into giving me more. Once the worker was completely covered, I lifted her and set her on a patch of moss-tentacled ground. The queen ran over. Uh, more of those salty dew drops slid from her eyes, uh, and she placed her claws on the worker, uh, felt the thorax and the head, and my antenna uh, read a burst of relief from her pores. That arduous task complete, I chittered at the queen. Uh, shall I sing a mating song for you? And she backed her, and her black eyes stared into mine. She tilted her head to the side, and even the dung-brained aphids and the bumbling cowworms understood when my kind spoke. But these new creatures, they, they had no antenna. Uh, for all the noise they made, I assumed they must be deaf. The queen tentatively reached out an arm and stroked my head with her soft claw. My antenna quivered with longing. Deep within my abdomen, desire built. The armor at the tip of my abdomen uh, drew back. Uh, Black-eyed queen, if only you'll have me. If only you'll have me. If only you'll have me, I sang. 
They spat one of the sticky wads of fuzzy pillar honey at her feet. She stepped back, uh, her face wrinkling up again. Uh, no pheromones of wanting came from her pores. Uh, if anything, I thought my antenna picked up sensations of confusion. Uh, but that seemed impossible. Uh, how could she not understand a nuptial gift? She ignored my offering and turned to a, a sack of cloth, which she set next to the fuzzy pillar. Dejected, I stored my nectar back in my cheek. Uh, two rejections of one day. And the queen danced around me and retrieved a giant vessel of amber liquid that looked very much like a honeypot. Only without the rest of the body. Uh, was this a game or, or an odd manner of courtship? I let my antenna lead me to an item with her scent, clutched it with my mandibles, and placed it on the pile. Oh, she had collected a variety of leaves and fruits. Though most were now bruised, uh, my new pet, the fuzzy pillar, followed me about. Uh, whining for more song. Not now, I muttered. I'm busy figuring out this queen. The black-eyed queen tried to harness my pet back under the uh, hollow boulder of dirt. Uh, but the fuzzy pillar would have none of that, especially after the difficulty she had getting it off. The queen gestured at me and then uh, to the fuzzy pillar as if she expected me to do something. Did she not understand? I was a drone, uh, not a worker. My two jobs were to eat and mate. Later, if I were successful, I would become her nursemaid and, and care for her young. But uh, perhaps I had confused her when I retrieved her worker. The queen sat down, uh, resting in the shade of the flower. Uh, she rubbed her hands over her swollen belly. Oh, aphid dung. I supposed she had a, a right to rest more than I did. I, I forgot that she was with eggs, given how small her belly was compared to that of my former queen. Uh, I cooed another lullaby to the fuzzy pillar, and she clumsily lumbered over, antenna swaying as she listened. Before long, she was nuzzling me and regurgitating. I anointed each piece of the queen's cargo with the sticky nectar and stuck it on the bristles, covering her back just as I had seen workers in my own hive do. This labor was quite beneath me, but I supposed I wasn't serving the queen by mating. I had uh, to make myself useful to the hive in some way. Better this than become a honey pot. With a load of food and the, the worker stuck to the fuzzy pillar, the queen mounted and rode at the front. It would have been easier for me to fly her to wherever we headed, but the nuptial rules were clear. The queen carries new attendants home. It is never the other way around. At least uh, this queen knew enough about fuzzy pillars to understand how to lead one. Uh, just as the workers back in my old hive did, she used food as an enticement. Though, unlike my hive sisters, who have uh, held flowers and sweet fruits out to the vehicles, uh, the queen held a leaf on a stick, dangling it in front of the fuzzy pillar's mouth, and she allowed the beast a burden to eat the leaf and then wasted time attaching another while our ride meandered over to munch on more leaves. Uh, tiring of this, I rose up to a flower and sawed through the stem. The trick was to use something much more enticing than a leaf, uh, something sweet. Uh, you do know why you can't let the fuzzy pillar eat the flower, don't you? Uh, she'll go back to munch and leaves. I showed the queen how it was done. Uh, the queen clapped her claws together. Uh, a high tinkle of sound escaping her mouth. My antenna sensed satisfaction. Well, we hadn't made it yet, but this was a start. It took all day to reach the queen's hive, and we left the purple forest of flowers and entered the area of uh, tree mountains, and I recognized my hive scent as we passed the tree that we burrowed under. Even further west, uh, toward the setting of the sun, was a strange little uh, complex of hills above ground, uh, my new queen's hive. Surrounding it, the earth had been cleared of flowers and plants. Pathetic. Little sprouts growing up instead. Uh, heavy in the air was the odor of burning wood and plants. Uh, I didn't like it. Attendants greeted the queen and helped her and her injured worker down. She leaned against me for support, smoothing her warm claws over my armor. Oh, she chattered away, waving her <laughs> up her appendages. I was starting to think those slender little limbs, I thought of his claws, were antenna. Oh, her voice was lower than that of a fresh hatchling, but without the range of a second stage larva, and certainly nothing close to what had been an adult possessed. If she had uh, slowed down and spoken that way to the fuzzy pillar instead of screeching at it, uh, she would have been rewarded with a mouthful of nectar. But then, from what I had experienced, queens did uh, do a lot of screeching. 
I marched beside her, observing the way her attendants regarded me. A, a buffet of tastes vibrated in the air for, for the six of them. First shock, uh, then awe, then suspicion and disgust. I had expected this. Uh, it would take time for my scent to adapt to theirs and for me to fit in. One of them with a swollen belly, bigger than the black-eyed queen, tentatively brushed, uh, an antenna slash arm over my thorax. I felt no compulsion to mate with this one. Perhaps she was a mm, honey pot, uh, not yet so burdened with nectar that she could walk. Uh, the queen gave me one last stroke before her attendants ushered her away. Young honey pot twitched her claw at me, making chittering sounds. More like uh, my kind than yours. Was that uh, her way of getting me to follow? And I did so taking in the smooth sides of the hills we passed, peering through the surfaces as we clear the water, but as hard as a rock. I know because I tapped out a few, startling the workers within. Young Honeypot waddled along her two legs, uh, taking me to the walled circle where more fuzzy pillars lounged amid piles of leaves. It, it looked very much like our uh, stable, only above ground with far more beasts of burden than we ever housed. I realize where all our stores of fuzzy pillars must have gone captured by this other hive. No wonder our resources had grown so scarce over the years as smooth rock enclosures uh, to one side housed more fuzzy pillars lounging in the shade. I suppose the fuzzy pillars would be able to hide under the overhang if a flesh-eating moth or fly came along. However, I couldn't imagine uh, how they would escape an arachnopede. Uh, didn't this hive see its folly? Yeah, perhaps this area was free of arachnopede tribes. The sun sank down the horizon and the sky turning green and then black. Brilliant twin moons, purple as the queen's belly, rose in the sky. Never having seen them before, I now understood why the workers of my tribe called them the Sky Queens. I ducked under the cover of the shelter and dug myself a hole. Uh, it was difficult work, hindered by my wings. Uh, my shelter was only large enough to house myself, but I had done much manual labor in that one day. I couldn't make myself do more. The last task I completed before I collapsed into my shallow hole was to bite off my wings. The first one I tore free, uh, sent a, a lance of fire down my back, uh, forcing myself to bite off the other, and then I slid into my hole to exhaust it, even to sing for nectar from the fuzzy pillars. I would have uh, liked to sleep for an entire season after that long day. Instead, I learned all too soon that this area was not free of arachnopedes. The screech! Of fuzzy pillars woke me. Oh, they started the, for the darkest hour of the night uh, when no Sky Queen shed light and the above-ground hive was as dark as the catacombs of my former palace. For the first time in hours, oh, my eyes felt at home. The fuzzy pillars crammed under the overhang, squirming over each other like, like, a, like a knot of worms during mating. They knocked dirt into my tunnel and blocked what was coming into view. My antenna twitched, sensing danger, but the air was so thick with agitation, it was difficult to hear anything else. Straining my antenna, the clack, clack, clack of arachnopede jaws echoed nearby, and the fuzzy pillar screams grew louder. They slicked their bodies with bitter juice, a defense uh, that would repel some species of arachnopedes. Giant mandibles appeared above the wall. An arachnopede's leg reached up and over, sinking into the dirt before me. A flash of light shot from behind our overhang, striking the leg. The arachnopede retracted, hissed, and sprang into the enclosure. The fuzzy pillars, mad with fear, pressed as close to the wall as they could. The beam of light shot out again, but missed. The arachnopede closed in. If only I had made my hole a little deeper. Another arachnopede climbed into the enclosure, and the wall cackled with, uh, with blue. Light shot out again, and the taste of charred flesh met my antenna. The, the closest one reached under the enclosure and yanked out a fuzzy pillar. I ducked my head down, unable to take in the sight of one of those gentle beasts being eaten. But what my eyes didn't see, my antenna did. The zip of light passing above the sizzle as it met the arachnopede armor and ate through. The reek of death and the blood of a fuzzy pillar on the ground. Arachnopede feet scuttled away. The fuzzy pillars continued to tremble in a tight bunch. I exited my hole, and arachnopede lay unmoving. The fuzzy pillar it had captured shuddered on the ground. Her sides lacerated where the arachnopede's pinchers had pierced her. The poison was already taking effect. Uh, I recognized her scent. It was my fuzzy pillar, uh, the one who brought me to this hive. And I touched my antenna to hers and sang a lullaby the last lullaby she would ever hear. 
The arachnopedes came twice more during the night, and I dug my hole deeper into the earth. I hadn't questioned why I should be housed with the fuzzy pillars. They provided a tasty buffet of nectar. Yet as I watched the way the workers came and let them out, I realized they were keeping me in. I chittered at the at the stable hand with a large belly. Uh, do, you, do you dare keep me from the queen, young honey pot? She patted my side and ignored me. Uh, see if I, uh, if she could keep me in. Fuzzy pillars were too slow-brained to think of leaving any stable so long as there was enough leaves to keep them busy eating. And I was not. I climbed up the wall, but a jolt shocked my body as I reached the top. I fell out of my back uh, and the stubs, where my wings had been bursting with pain. Uh, I rolled over and I tried a, a different section of the wall and was jolted again. I clicked my mandibles with indignation. A dirty aphid dung, mothra fly poison breath, I swore, using phrases I picked up from the shepherds. Uh, I clicked my mandibles at the queen's workers, and their fear drifted up into the air. They left me. I didn't, st- there's my cat. I didn't uh, stop swearing until the queen appeared. I bowed my head and immediately ceased, then spat up the bead of nectar from my cheek. If only you'll have me, if only you'll have me, if, if only you'll have me, I sang. Oh, beautiful queen of queens. Black-eyed beauty and the one I most desire. She stared at the glob of nectar, touched it with her foot, and then drew back. When she didn't take it, I scooped it back into my mouth, rejected again. Is that why she sealed me up with the fuzzy pillars? Was I nothing more than a honey pot, as the other queen had said? Well, my antennae uh, flinched at these thoughts, my disgrace obvious. The queen didn't even look at my antenna. Uh, she patted my thorax and ran her hands over my wingless back. And was she pleased? I couldn't tell. She beckoned me to follow. She led me from the pen and walked with me, speaking calmly like a lullaby intended for a fuzzy pillar. I wanted to tell her uh, what had happened the night before, but it wasn't my place to inform her of battles. It was uh, for her warriors and workers to tell her that, and I couldn't make myself uh, understood. The black-eyed queen led me down a trail thick with the scent of many from her hive, uh, passing the smooth hills with the clear sections for seeing inside. Uh, uh, she rubbed her hands over her abdomen, a, a gesture I had seen her make the day before. Others passed, stopping and pointing to me, and I listened and smelled, gleaning as much as I could, which uh, wasn't much. She took me to a, to a small hill, connected to the others. Uh, she circled, tapping at a clear section. Out came two workers, and, uh, one I recognized from the day before as the handmaiden I'd fetched for her. She moved stiffly, the toxins of mothrafly powder still in her system. Uh, if she knew what was good for her, she would she'd drink some fuzzy pillar nectar, but this hive didn't have a lot of common sense. They sat down on little structures, not quite rock and not quite earth, and I couldn't place a scent. Now the queen gestured to me and spoke to these attendants. In the overwhelming array of perfumes the day before, I had failed to notice that uh, these workers were larger than their queen. Though her belly was certainly more plump, uh, her injured worker was uh, paler, with the tuft of hairs on her head, more brown than black. Uh, The other attendant was like the queen, Black eyes and hair and similar in scent, though the pheromones of the queen's skin marked her as mm, eh, fertile. Uh, Could they have been larva mates? Coming from the same drone? The dark worker's mouth drew back and stretched over her cheeks. She patted my head in the same way the queen did, inviting air about her. Her voice was much deeper than the queen's as she said a word I soon came to recognize as that which they called me, a, 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 a rover. The other one, uh, the injured worker, didn't exude vibrations of goodwill welcome. Instead, uh, I tasted a pungent dislike mingled with uh, fear. Silly, considering I was the one who uh, had saved her. Uh, The clear entrance opened again and a new scent assaulting my antenna, uh, sweet and heady as my queen's. This one also spoke of fertility and allure. Her voice was high and frail, like a, like a larva's. I lost my wits and sang to her and uh, ejected nectar. My armor slid back. This green-eyed queen stepped around the nectar and approached the black-eyed queen, and I looked from one to the other. Uh, two queens? Aphid droppings. Uh, this would be bad. I expected a sharp explosion of chemical anger, and then a battle. Indeed, yet the two queens came together, and they released such other immediately uh, and sat down, patting each other's abdomens. What a curious hive indeed. Well, I was allowed to come and go amongst the fuzzy pillars as I pleased. 
because I wished to be close to my queen and attend to her needs. I tunneled near her chamber and remained there at night. And when it rained, uh, I blocked up the entrance the best I could, but water still seeped in. I swallowed the water uh, in my dwelling and uh, spewed it up outside over and over until it was dry. As I accompanied my queen where she went outside her chamber, I became a curiosity among Sir Colony. Unlike my old hive, no one helped this queen. When she toiled like a common worker in the fields or collected leaves of the fuzzy pillar, I was the one to lift giant stalks from the forest floor uh, or pull the sickly plants from the ground. Even as she grew rounder, she continued to work. Uh, through her work, outside became more infrequent, and uh, her work inside increased. Because her personal attendant would not permit me to enter the interior chambers, uh, I watched through the clear sections of the wall, and I noted how she placed leaves, uh, fruit, and nectar into a box, causing pictures of beautiful patterns to shine on the wall. Uh, some of these items made the soft flesh around her mouth pull back and emit a high tinkling. Others caused her to crinkle up her face and shake her head. I was uh, learning to decipher the munition of a uh, posture and the fluctuations in facial muscles uh, when I could not smell her. One day, as I worked alongside the black-eyed queen, pulling scraggly plants and loading them in a container, uh, I would then carry back for her. The earth vibrated under our feet. Oh, my antenna twitched with glee. Even before she poked her head from the earth, I knew it would be a cowworm. Ah, I chittered at her, and she poked her head out farther, and I messaged her with an antenna, and she squirmed to expose more of herself. The queen cried out in alarm. Uh, workers raced over, and I hummed a song to let them know it was all all right. The worm wouldn't hurt anyone. The queen circled her arms around me, trying to tug me back. Perhaps she wanted the worm uh, all to herself. It was all right. I backed away, bowing my head in apology, and I waited for her to massage the worm and, and lap up the honey sweat. Instead, uh, uh, the workers pointed what appeared to be a branch of the worm and bolts of blue light shot out, uh, searing through the worm's skin and, and cutting her into pieces. Oh, she shrieked in pain and quivered and then went, uh, and then went still. Well, with that, why don't we take a little break and I can uh, take you upstairs to the master bedroom where I can read to you the newest upcoming romance novels from Penguin Random House Books. Okay, are you ready? Can I come in now? I can? All right, here I go. I got my eyes covered like I promised. And I hear, oh, oh, there you are, laid out across my master waterbed. And you look gorgeous. Your boots are the same color as the rest of your outfit. And uh, I love the tiny little top hat that's on the top of your head. You look amazing, but it's not what I'm in the mood for. I'll tell you what I'm in the mood for. I'm in the mood for you to wear this white sheet, nope, not racist, as a ghost outfit, uh, as I read to you a new upcoming romance novel called Ghosts by Dolly Alderton. Uh, it's an international bestseller already, apparently, even though it's not released yet. Uh, a smart, sexy, laugh-out-loud romantic comedy about ex-boyfriends and perfect parents, uh, friends with kids, and a man who disappears the moment he says, I love you. An absolute knockout, wickedly funny, and at uh, turns both cynical and sincere, uh, feels like your very favorite friend, says Taylor Jenkins Reed, author of Malibu Rising. Nina Dean... It's not especially bothered that she's single. Nah, she owns her own apartment. Uh, and she's about to publish her second book. Uh, and she has a great relationship with her ex-boyfriend and enough friends to keep her social calendar full and her hangovers plentiful. That's not a good sign. That's actually a bad sign. And when she uh, downloads a dating app, she does the seemingly impossible. She meets a great guy on her first date. Max is handsome and built like a lumberjack. Ah, uh, he has floppy blonde hair and a stable job, period. That's a weird comparison. He has floppy blonde hair and a stable job. That's the end of that sentence. But more surprising than anything else, Nina and Max have chemistry. Their conversations are witty and ironic. Oh, they both hate sports. <laughs> and they dance together like fools. Yeah, I, I, I happily dig deep into the nuances of crappy music. Uh, and they create an entire universe of private jokes and, and chemical bliss. 
But when Max uh, ghosts her, oh, here it comes. Nina is forced to deal with everything she's been uh, trying so hard to ignore. Her father's Alzheimer's is getting worse, and so is his mother, uh, her mother's denial of it. Her editor hates her new book idea, and her best friend from childhood is icing her out. Funny, tender, and eminently movingly relatable. Ghosts is a whip-smart tale of relationships in modern life. Oh, he doesn't die? This isn't about ghosts at all. Well, I thought when he ghosted her, it's like, yeah, he's dead. Now he's a spirit now. It's like, oh, it sucks to have a boyfriend that's just a ghost. He's always around, but you can't, like, hear him speak. No, he's just not talking to her anymore. Well, I don't want to read this. It comes out in hardcover August 3rd. Apparently it's already an international bestseller. Uh, you can find it at Amazon. Barnes & Noble, Bookshop.org, Hudson Booksellers, Indiebound, Powell's Target, my favorite, Books A Million, uh, just because I like the name, and Walmart. Well, that's disappointing uh, that everyone's still alive in this story, and uh, I'm not aroused anymore, so take that sheet off and uh, let's go back down to the library and finish the rest of this book. Well, now that we're back, why don't we settle in? The scent of death hung in the air, rattling down my antenna and into my core. Why would why would anyone ever want to uh, harm a, a cow worm? Ah, they're cute like larvae with minds as simple and, and innocent as hatchlings. Oh, Oh, there were other things I witnessed among my new hive that I couldn't understand. Uh, when my, my queen's ally, the green-eyed queen, uh, at least laid her eggs, uh, my queen went with her and uh, their attendants to a hill with dried little branches sticking out of the mouth. Oh, I had long avoided this place as it reeked, reeked of death. I then laid the unmoving larva within the earth and buried it, uh, placing one of those dead branches above, uh, though the other queen was the only one who lamented in her high, uh, larva-like cries. The thickness of sorrow pricking my antenna came from them all. Uh, how odd that a queen uh, should lament the death of another queen's kin uh, as the months passed, the black-eyed queen's belly swelled. I discovered when my queen laid her eggs that there were uh, no eggs, uh, only a, a single larva. Hey, girl, say they, they, they buried my queen's larva in the mound as well. Uh, something was wrong with this tribe's eggs if none of them lived. Uh, the black-eyed queen no longer smelled of fertility. And I was then struck with the realization I could no longer mate with her if she uh, had no eggs for, for me to fertilize. I was neither able to to serve as drone and future mate, nor as potential nurse maid. I, I left her for a time, examining the others in the hive. Now there are no other queens, but they and their attendants did not want me. The green-eyed queen became a, a queen again for a time. Her attendant permitted me to tunnel near the queen's chamber. Uh, she gifted me with sweet morsels, mm, and the queen did not eat. Uh, the attendant even permitted me to enter their chambers. When the rain came and my tunnels filled with water, uh, I came to realize more perplexing details about their hive structure. Now, there, there are no chambers of drones or rooms where they stored eggs uh, 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 and larvae. The only individual the queen appeared to mate with was uh, her single attendant. Yeah, girl, so it could be that these attendants were, in fact, drones. Hmm, yeah. And did they only have one each? Yeah. I spent a great deal of time studying scents and grouping them into categories of gender. If my observations were correct, they were drones who, uh, who sometimes attended female workers, though uh, sometimes these female workers appeared to attend the drones, yeah, yeah, more than the other way around. Uh, any of these female workers uh, could mate with her drone at any given time. Uh, doing so did not make the drone lose his genitals, weird, or turn them into a female nursemaid. Upon becoming fertilized... Uh, the female worker then became swollen with a, with a single larva uh, within her, and she smelled like a queen, though in all my wanderings I found not one larva anywhere in the colony. Uh, but good reason, the human hive killed worms instead of milking them and used fuzzy pillars for their travel rather than to collect their regurgitated nectar, uh, and they would never become fertile this way 
how humans were stealing our resources and wasting them. Though I began to decipher the meaning and various sounds they made, uh, simple words and commands, uh, no, or, 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 outside, or inside, rover, and, uh, good boy, they were unable to grasp any of mine. Now they paid little heed to the teachings I tried to bestow upon them, uh, with the fuzzy pillars, uh, not even young honeypot, who was in charge of the stables, who I had now identified as uh, an old drone. Though I often uh, encountered the black-eyed queen in my wanderings, uh, and she had often greeted me with, uh, Hello, Rover, uh, and stroked my head. I did not return to her again until uh, her scent changed back to that of a queen. I then spent the majority of my time listening to her words and attempting to repeat the ones she said most frequently, uh, Come here, and uh, uh, follow me, and eat, and uh, uh, a walk. I realized the sound she made, wan, was not wa, a sound she, uh, larva made. Uh, this is how she called her drone, though sometimes she called him you and I uh, am my husband. Instead, uh, Lara was the word for queen that uh, she called herself. When I repeated the sounds my queen made, she, she tilted her head to the side and sometimes laughed. Uh, when her drone wasn't around and demanding her attention, she pointed to objects, uh, said words, and made me uh, repeat them. Uh, they came out garbled and trilled and high and low, but eventually I learned the words chair, uh, food, uh, friend, and fuzzy pillar. Uh, she tried to teach me the word love, but uh, she pointed to too many things, uh, including that vexing drone of hers. So I didn't understand uh, what that meant. The next time a cow worm unearthed itself in the field of scrawny plants and uh, did not belong on my world. I, I shook my head when she screamed, uh, friend, I trilled. She tilted her head to the side, watching me coax the worm from the earth and, uh, and massage it. Friend, food, I said as beads of honey sweat formed on the worm's skin. I lapped him up with my tongue. I stroked the worm's belly with my antenna. The baby food, eat, Laura, eat. Yeah, she shook her head, uh, her way of saying no. Uh, Laura, food, go. I struggled to express the importance of fermented nectar, uh, but there were still so many words I needed to learn. I think the black-eyed queen would have left the cow worm alone, only to her drone and another came over and used their bolts of light to kill her. If they kept up this raid of cow worm murder, none of the hives in the area would have nectar for winter. As Laura's belly... It grew larger. I came to understand more words. Uh, death, uh, grave, sorrow, uh, uh, and alone. Her next larva came sooner and was a, a smaller bundle they placed in the earth. Laura won food, I insisted, pushing a bead of hardened nectar toward her. Uh, baby big, baby strong, friend food, eat no baby death. Well, she struck one of my antenna with a finger, and I absorbed her melancholy. Worse than that was the horrible sensation she passed into me, making my exoskeleton uh, feel as though it were fracturing and the insides oozing out through the cracks. She took the nugget of nectar, uh, yet she didn't eat it. She placed it on the table inside her chamber where I was not allowed. I knew I should have looked for another queen, yeah, but I couldn't bear to. The black-eyed queen was the only one I wanted now, the long, warm season began. That's my cat. Just knocking stuff over in the middle of my show. The long, warm season began to dwindle, and soon it would be winter. Oh, I dug deeper in the earth, knowing I would need to stay where it was warm. I dug a chamber where I stored leaves and dried beads of nectar. I explored farther and farther from the human camp to collect fuzzy pillar eggs and small hatchlings for the winter stores. When the first frost came, uh, my black-eyed queen stood at the entrance of my tunnel, calling me in a whisper, uh, Rover, come. Oh, I came. And she snuck me into the chamber and hid me beneath the table under an unpalatable fuzzy leaf she called a, a, a blanket. Secret. Juan doesn't know, she told me. Juan did not notice me as he stayed in the other room with her. She did this many more times when the light of day waned and the air chilled with night. And I did not like her coming out of the warmth of her chambers where the predators like the night arachnopedes might capture her. Oh, I learned to listen for her opening the door. And in the morning, I returned to my tunnels in the slightly warmer hours when the sun came up. 
and Drone One uh, was not yet awake. Uh, one day, her drone caught her in the act of bringing me inside, and he raised his voice to his queen and spoke many insolent words I dare not repeat. Oh, it was still too painful to imagine anyone would speak this way to a queen. Now, though she was uh, barren for a time, uh, she was queen again now, for she was growing another larva within her. And though it was too small to show as of yet, the black-eyed queen argued with her drone, and just when I thought she'd put him in his place, he raised a hand and struck her across the face. Oh, my nerves exploded into a frenzy. I turned about in a circle, unable to comprehend what I had seen. My queen was sobbing now, uh, screaming at her drone as he screamed back at her. I toppled over a chair. My head swam with dizzying anger in the enclosed space. Uh, the drone kicked out at me but missed. Uh, the hot, tart rankness of anger pressed in on me, becoming unbearable as the drone grabbed the black-eyed queen by the shoulders and shook her. I couldn't tolerate it any longer. I, I, I grabbed him by the leg uh, with, my, with my mandibles and flung him off her. Oh, he stumbled back onto the shelves of what they call books and knocked over the stores of items I couldn't identify. Uh, my, my bead of nectar rolled onto the floor, shriveled and small. Uh, she spoke with cool authority of a queen. Though I couldn't hear her words with the way her emotions buzzed against my antenna, uh, I stayed by her side as she packed her bags, bundled herself up, and left. How I wished she would let me take her inside the tunnels I had dug. Fuzzy pillars, warm, rover, hive food. As she shook her head and continued on, uh, the claw covers, as she called boots, crackling against the rough ice on the ground, I moved slowly, and the chill of the wind rattling through my armor and slowing my pace. She knocked on the door of the black-eyed drone, as she called Marco, her larva mate, and his green-eyed queen named uh, Alan, they allowed us to come in. Oh, the black-eyed queen stayed with her larva mate and this ally queen, and she now had no drone of her own. Her people uh, only took one drone at a, at a time. Uh, was this my chance to mate with her? Uh, I spat up a bead of nectar. Food, gift, Laura, eat, Laura Strong, baby food. She sat on the chair next to the other queen. I don't have a baby right now. Yes, Laura, baby. Uh, Laura, uh, eat nectar food. And I nudged the nectar closer with my mandibles. Laura touched a hand to her flat belly. For once, the idea of growing a larva didn't please her. Hey, let me see that. Joan Marco took the nectar bead from the ground and held it up to the artificial light. Uh, no, Laura gift, not Marco gift. He made a word clear and slow like she did. Laura can't eat this gift. It isn't food for humans, and I will make it will make her sick. Well, no, you have sick. Old baby of Laura's sick and death. I tried to explain. Dirt worm, uh, eat. Worm milk. Plants eat. Plants. Fuzzy pillars eat. Fuzzy pillars. Uh, spider eat. Uh, dead spider. Dirt eat. Uh, there are many more species that ate each other, but I didn't want to confuse them. All eat nectar. All babies eat nectar. No death. I repeated myself, uncertain whether they understood the cycle. Uh, every creature had to eat nectar, even if they didn't get it directly from the plants. It's what made us uh, eh, healthy. It's what made drones compatible with other hives at uh, Queens. We're all linked through nectar. Drone Marco nodded. Eh, interesting. There may be something to this. He turned to me. I will take Laura's gift with me to the, uh, to the lab. Oh, he's got a home lab. We will examine it and we'll see if it's safe. Uh, there was hope of her at least accepting my offering. They allowed me to accompany them deeper into the catacomb of their hills. Others of their kind skirting away when they saw me. Uh, once inside the, right, uh, the white room, uh, Drone Marco cut my offering into little bits and placed them on glass. He examined many pieces, pointing to the wall where pictures of bubbles and dots appeared, and they glowed the same amber as the nectar. I tried to clamp my mandibles around the vision of honey on the wall, uh, but they only meant air. There was no taste of sweet uh, that my antenna could pick up. Uh, he pointed to black dots in the amber, which he called bacteria. He showed us many other pictures, uh, using his magic box to enlarge the minuscule. Uh, this is the disease that's been killing those with impaired immune systems, uh, our elderly, and our unborn. 
Drone Marco pointed to red squirming worms in another picture he made on the wall, and again, many of his words were, well, eh, lost on me. I still understood the color red. Uh, the marking of death among his hive and his signal of moth or fly poison among mine. I wondered if these uh, red worms were what caused their aversion to the gentle cow worms. The black-eyed queen created pictures of her own, mixing the red worms with my gift. We all watched and waited, and the taste of the air changed, the salty sweet of hope. Other humans came from adjoining chambers to join us. The black-eyed queen pointed to the black dots around the red worms. Uh, I think this nectar has natural antimicrobial properties. Uh, they might be why the native species on this planet are affected like we are. I didn't understand all what she said, uh, but I knew she was pleased as her fingers smoothed over my antenna. I need more samples, the best nectar, Drone Marco said. Uh, there were no flowers at this time of year. Fuzzy pillars, I said. I sacrificed my underground food stores for my queen. After many tests, Marco decided it might be safe. I remember the moment when he told me this, uh, holding the yellow uh, green vial and bringing it to his lips. Laura Gift, I screeched and clacked my mandibles together. I understand, but no human has ever drunk this, and I don't want to give this to my sister. I would rather it uh, make me sick than her. Do you understand? Yes. I made my head nod as, as they did. I would rather a drone die than my queen. Well, he drank, making a face. Uh, he didn't die. Uh, the following day and another after that, he drank. And he studied many images on the wall and consulted uh, meh, other humans. Uh, after many small tastes, Drone Marco at last intended to give the black-eyed queen a vial. Rover, gift Lara, I insisted. Yes, thank you for the gift, she said. No, she didn't understand. No, Marco gift, Rover gift. I didn't spit out a nugget of nectar, afraid she would refuse it again. Uh, Drone Marco had warned her that my body contained impurities that might taint the nectar. And they didn't know how she might react. I understand the gift is from you, not Marco. She moved to take the vial of yellow-green fluid from her larva mate. My antenna twitched in agitation. Marco studied me for a moment and, and then poured the liquid into a different container. He leaned over and held it out to me, and I closed my mandibles around it and, and brought it to Laura. She drank. I waited for the armor on my lower abdomen to peel back for the frenzy, the mating dance to take hold of me. Nothing happened. Eh, perhaps I was too cold to do so. Perhaps, uh, perhaps I needed fresh nectar. If only I had a cow worm to milk. Each day, Drone Marco prepared her nectar and then handed it to me to bring to my black-eyed queen. Each day she thanked me, and she grew rounder, and the perfume of fertility stronger, and there were times when I yearned to shed my armor and to mate with her. When I brought a, uh, thought of my black-eyed queen, my armor ached and my antenna quivered uh, with delight. I hated to think I would never mate. I hadn't been able to fertilize the queen of my kind, whether because I had been drunk or fermented nectar or because uh, I was uh, uh, impotent. Uh, even if I had been able to fertilize Lara, I suspected it wouldn't work as she already had a larva inside her. Still, I wanted to offer my seed to her as my greatest sacrifice and, and becoming her nursemaid for the rest of my days. The yearning in me grew as the months of cold dwindled by her. Her scent overpowered me with wanting. Her belly swelled larger than young honeypots. The sun thawed, uh, the frozen earth, and the human's hive returned to its barren fields. Uh, how surprised I was one day as I chatted away with Lara. Something was growing quite good at it. Uh, when her larva mate burst into the chamber, shouting with so much joy, uh, he made my antenna twitch. Uh, it, it's a worm! Alive, uh, in my lab, Drone Marco huffed. I raced away with him, leaving the black-eyed queen to, uh, to waddle along uh, like, a, like a honey pot. Uh, they had been harmed as cowworm, uh, though they contained her in a giant clear casing without any dirt or, or moisture. Give dirt and water for the worm, I said, and then I milk for nectar. Drone Marco instructed his workers to, to do as I bid, and then opened a door for me to climb into the chamber with her. I showed them how to, to massage the worm and, and where to collect the, the honey sweat 
Oh, oh, a drone. Marco climbed in with me and I gently pressed two fingers as though they were antenna. And at first he bumbled <laughs> like a hatchling, but eventually he, he mastered it. Oh, I let him collect his samples. I didn't offer to regurgitate my own and give them to him. I stored them in my belly, waiting till later when I was just uh, my queen and me in the chamber. I waited until Queen Ellen was cooking in the other room where I wasn't permitted. I would uh, I have the best gift for Laura. Worm nectar, I said. My black-eyed queen waited for me to, 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 to spit it up, uh, but worm nectar isn't like that from a fuzzy pillar. Uh, honey sweat isn't a thick amber that will harden with time. Uh, it's a liquid, uh, and I had no vessel to hold it. I need a container. She glanced about and finally kneeled before me and held out her hands, cupping them like a bowl. The gesture was so different from what we had done before. The, the offering previously going from me to her larva uh, mate and then back to me. The uh, burp, the intimacy of the moment uh, as I placed my mouth over her hands and regurgitated was greater than any other I'd shared with her. Drink. Uh, this is the best nectar. She stared down at the liquid in her hands, dribbles leaking through her fingers and, and splattering onto the floor. Drink for your baby. You'll have a you'll have a healthy baby. She brought her hands up to her lips and drank. Uh, more? Oh my God! Don't tell me you just drank that. Queen Ellen said from the doorway. The sensation of my armor crushing my thorax, my gut tube churning, an antenna tasting every perfume in the air was too much to hold any longer. Ah, uh, this is what I had felt uh, for the other queen of my kind. I was sure. This wanting, yearning craving was beyond what any drone had ever felt for any queen. Yeah, yeah, what's wrong with them? Queen Ellen asked. Oh, he only gets like this when, when something upsets him. My black-eyed queen crouched over me, smoothing her warm, fleshy fingers over my face, uh, remnants of my nectar offering clinging to her skin. She stroked my antenna until I could take it no longer. I rolled onto my back the best position to take aim, since she wasn't built like one of my own kind. Ah, uh, the throes of ecstasy shuddered through my abdomen. My armor peeled back. In a burst, my genitals exploded onto her abdomen, splattering purple matter over her white clothes. Oh, her face scrunched up, and she stared down at herself, uh, and then me. Tiny dots of purple covered her uh, thorax in her face. My, my exposed posterior burned. Uh, with electric throbs. Bits of inside matter dangled over the sides of my armor and as if I were to become her handmaiden. I, I knew I was supposed to chew off the remaining parts and reseal my armor with my saliva, uh, but the pain was so intense, I didn't, I, I didn't know how any drone had ever managed. My antenna caught the sizzle and smoke of her fabric before she did. The white clothes hissed as they disintegrated, and, uh, and she screamed, uh, when the seed touched her skin, uh, she fell onto the floor, her agony twisting my antenna with newfound pain. Uh, I didn't understand. The queen was supposed to rejoice at the offerings of her drone. The other queen screamed, too. And she filled buckets of water and splashed them over the black-eyed queen. Uh, this made the hissing worse as my entrails spread over her and the floor. Laura writhed like a frightened fuzzy pillar, clawing my seeds away. Had I just killed the one I revered above all else? I had to make this right. Despite the shock of pain, I knew I had enough strength to chew off the remains of my abdomen, or I could use my energy to chew the last store of fuzzy pillar nectar in my cheek and gift her with the medicine that she had once saved her drone. I regurgitated a bead of nectar from my cheek and softened it inside my mouth until it was mixed together. I spit it on my queen, whose cries subsided into a whimper. I then lay down to die. I was aware of the trample of feet as drones came and collected the queen. A familiar sense invaded the space around me, but the world floated above my head, too far above my pain to make sense. At one point, I managed to curl up on my side and chew away bits of my exposed genitals. I didn't get very far. Uh, I lay down again, too weak to move, and my mouth pin and pined uh, for nectar. I wanted to die. I deserved to die. Drones did not hurt their queens. Uh, I, was a, I was a freak, no better than Drone Juan. Eventually, Drone Marco found me. He, he sheathed himself in layers of thick skin and cleaned me. 
Yeah, he tried to stuff my insides back into my armor, uh, but I bleeded. No, chew off. He cut them off, put on new skin cloth, and he cleaned the rest of my seed from the floor. For a long time, eh, he said nothing. Sorrow radiated from him like a, like a cloud of pollen. At last he spoke, his voice rough and gravelly, sounding more like mine. Rover, uh, what happened? Ellen said you got upset about something and it fell over and exploded. Are you, are, you, are, you, are you sick? Pain fogged my head, making it difficult for me to think clearly enough to speak. I, in sick pain, Rover give death to Laura, kill baby. Rover nectar vessel now. Uh, although my language skills have progressed greatly, I, I didn't know how to say honeypot. I let out a long, low keening in my distress. Uh, Lara is dead. The baby is dead. They're just... He broke down and cried. I waited outside Laura's new chamber. I wasn't allowed to go in. It, it didn't matter. I could smell enough to know what was going on. The, the salt of sweat, the stench of blood, and the sweetness of the new larva vibrated against my antenna, as did the cries from my queen and the cries from someone else. The posterior of my abdomen throbbed, and I gnawed at the uncomfortable pressure of the fabric Drone Marco had stretched around me. Uh, I had tried to tell him I didn't need it, uh, but he insisted. He was as bossy as a fuzzy pillar shepherd. Many humans entered and exited in distress, and when that aphid dung wan was permitted in, uh, it was too much. Oh, I snapped at the nursemaid who guarded the door and pushed past her. My black-eyed queen lay in bed. Bandaged with white fabric. Blotchy red swellings marred the places on her face that were exposed. Her, her belly was wrapped up. It was flatter than it had been. A, a larva secure in her arms. My, my queen's eyes were half slits, and she smelled of chemicals. But her lips curved up as she saw me. Well, her voice was barely a whisper, but I still heard her. There's my rover. You were right. The nectar made my baby strong. My beautiful baby. She turned to gaze to the bundle she held. Tears filled her eyes. I hung my head in shame. Surely she didn't understand. That isn't a baby. It's a monster. That toxin you've been drinking did this. Drone Juan shouted. Drone Marco held him back. Drone Marco spoke coolly, as evenly as a queen. I wasn't listening. My attention remained on my black-eyed queen. Her breath came out in labored rasps, and I smelled death. No nectar could cure this. Love my baby rover. Don't let him hurt her. She isn't a monster. She closed her eyes, tears spilling down her cheeks and soaking under the gauze. Uh, her breath grew shallow, and the gurgling and tickling sounds I associated with humans uh, stopped inside her. I raised myself to see over the edge of the bed. The larva she held in her arms wasn't the golden brown of her own skin or the lighter tone of Juan's, but a bright orange, uh, like nectar fresh from a fuzzy pillar's mouth. This miniature human was hairless, save for two places that sprouted up like antenna. Though I, I, I later learned they were not, uh, she squinted like a drone emerging from the underground palace uh, for the nuptial flight. I touched an antenna to the cheek of the baby human, expecting to find it soft like her mother's. Instead, it felt firm and hard as armor. Though it wasn't armor, judging by the way she could manipulate it and scrunch it from one expression to another, uh, I saw no monster, only a beautiful larva. Her splendor was so great that my antenna hurt to smell her. I had never understood the word love, no matter how many times my black-eyed queen explained it. I, I wondered if this pleasant hurt was it. Drone Juan reached toward the larva, fingers stiff and curled like claws. Uh, before he could harm uh, my charge, I snatched the wrist in my mandible and twisted uh, the armor inside his soft flesh, crunching. He screamed and dropped to his knees. I was no longer a drone. I was the queen's nursemaid. I would not allow Drone Juan or anyone else to harm the future queen. Carefully, I scooped her up and carried her away. Weak from my injury, my young charge and I rode a fuzzy pillar to my former home, for I knew no safer place than a nursery. An entire cycle of seasons had passed since I left my old hive, and I had no longer smelled of, uh, of my people. 
I waited until a scrawny hatchling emerged from the tunnels. I snatched her up and rubbed her scent over me and then over the daughter of the black-eyed queen before I released her. Every worker, a shepherd, and a nursemaid we passed in the tunnels twitched her antenna at me, noticing the foreignness of my scent. Yet they must also have been convinced by the young scouts, for none stopped or attacked. There in my hive I stored the future human queen in with the larva to be fed the most precious drops of nectar. Yeah, you're not so different from them, daughter of Lara. You have, you have two legs uh, and arms like them and eyes on the front of your head, uh, but you also understand the language of the hive, the nectar gifts you with skin like armor uh, and makes you strong like my kind. Ah, I'm an old nursemaid ha, who has seen too many winters. Uh, soon I will be forced into the role of honeypot. Uh, you will have to leave this place and, and brave the world above without me. Take a fuzzy pillar uh, to be your legs and a store of nectar as your food. Uh, go on the day of your nuptial flight when predators will focus on those in the air. Return to your human hive and, and tell them what you've learned. They must come to understand there, there will be no children and no future hive if they do not change their ways. It is true the nectar will produce unusual larva. Uh, that doesn't make you a monster. It means you are their future. Well, here we are back down in the smoking room, because I'm still trying to pretend like I live in a mansion with different rooms that we meet in for different purposes. The purpose of this room is to recap what we just read. And oh boy, is it complicated. Uh, a space wasp wants to rub his privates on the thorax of a queen, any queen, uh, but he can't perform. So he runs across a human woman and her husband, Juan, and uh, saves Juan. Uh, he decides that this woman is good, uh, is good enough to be his queen and starts trying to court her. But of course, they can't speak each other's languages. She doesn't know what he's doing. She keeps calling him Rover and petting him. And he doesn't get what's going on because nothing's working. Uh, she teaches him how to talk and he teaches her how to uh, farm things like fuzzy pillars instead of just killing them all the time. And he notices that she keeps getting pregnant from Juan. But uh, the babies never survive, and they always seem unhappy. So he gives her nectar uh, that'll keep her baby healthy. Of course, Juan slips in and has to be like, oh, I think it's poison. So they run tests on it. Of course, it's fine, because the wasp isn't going to try and kill her. Uh, but then one day, uh, when he's going to give her the nectar, she holds out her hands in a kind of a weird way, kind of a way he hasn't seen before. It, it just catches him at the right, right moment, right mood. Uh, and then on top of that, uh, so that throws him off, and then she goes and she pets his thorax, and his pent-up sexual energy explodes. It turns out that stuff is highly toxic and burns you, uh, and so then he has to try and save her life by throwing more nectar at her, uh, which does keep her alive long enough for her to uh, uh, have her baby, but then she passes away, which makes him feel horrible. But the baby is more like the wasp, with the yellow skin and kind of a hard shell. And it... Uh, he takes it to his old hive to uh, start a new humanity. What's good about this story? Well, it's well written, for one. It's nice to read something that's modern and well written. Uh, but then also, uh, the wasp is a gentleman the entire time. He never oversteps his bounds, even though he's desperately waiting for opportunities. What sucks makes me doubt the motivations of my cats. Anytime my pets are nice to me, uh, what's going on in their head? What do they really want from me, besides food? When they follow me around and meow at me because they want attention? Now I'm looking at them sideways, never fully trusting them. What do we learn? Uh, be careful how you pet things. Uh, you know when you pet a dog and stuff and it gets all excited and then dogs try to hump you? I was at a friend's house one time and I was laying on the floor watching TV because there's no room on the couch. We're all gathered around. And in this big, huge bulldog that he owned called Hemi just came up and started humping all over my legs and trying to work his way up to, like, my my stomach. And I am screaming and had to get this huge, heavy thing off me. Oh, everyone laughed. And that's what people do when dogs try to hump you. People laugh. They think it's funny. I've seen videos of it on the internet. Uh, it's not funny because that dog's horny. 
it's disturbing, if you think about it, that the dog's focusing on you. So anyways, this book's made me think about that to a, a larger extent. I side with the wasp for accidentally uh, taking a gesture the wrong way. I've been at Target, uh, and I've seen like a 60-year-old woman cough weird, and it haunts me for days afterwards. So I get it. I don't blame him, but I do blame people not paying more attention that animals have uh, certain kind of drives also. Well, with that, thanks for listening, uh, and I will see you on the next installment of Serena Dory Month as I read the next short story in this book. Ah, uh, well, it appears you found me in the part of the podcast I hate the most where I tell you all about the places on the internet where you can find me. You can tell I hate this because of the sound effects making it sound like a stormy night uh, in the drawing room of the damned. Now, there's there's that. Uh, I, I, are you cool? I like cool people. It's the reason why I got involved in this business to begin with, just to meet cool people. Not losers. So if you're cool, uh, feel free to go over to my website, uh, nuzzlehouse.com. We can see a backlog of everything I've ever read, uh, along with episodes from Book Boys and uh, blah, blah, blah. You can also find me on Instagram, uh, which is uh, House Nuzzle. And conveniently enough, uh, Twitter, which is also at House Nuzzle. Annoyingly, YouTube made me pick a name instead of just a house nuzzle. So you got Glenn Nuzzles. So I guess you search for that if you want to watch a screen that doesn't do anything and just hear my voice. Uh, and since, uh, since I think you might be cool, you can always just email me directly. Glenn.nuzzles at gmail.com But don't, uh, don't email if you're a, a nerdlinger or a dork. Now, back to business. I can't believe I drank all of them already. There's one left. <laughs>